friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I've come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Bonus marks, if you can tell me where that's from. Uh, no, I'm just joking, I don't give bonus marks. I um, hope you guys are doing good. Let's begin with combinatoric lesson two, uh, permutations with repetitions and restrictions. Now, yesterday we uh, talked about what a permutation is, and it's essentially an arrangement of um, a group of elements where the order is important. So changing the order produces a different result. So these are sorts, the sorts of things we talk about here are uh, lineups, if people are gonna line up. Uh, if people are in committees with unique positions, like there's a president and there's a secretary and there's a treasurer, um, <clears throat> when we are dealing with a string of letters, um, all of those sorts of things uh, would be situations where changing the order produces a different result and so therefore that's a permutation, okay? Um, so what we want to do today is we want to just keep going with that thought but go in a little deeper and look at what happens when we have uh, items inside there that are identical and what happens when we have uh, other restrictions uh, upon us, okay? So, first of all, take a look at this and see if you believe me. I'd like you to try it. Now, if you've tried it, maybe you pause me. If you tried it, you're probably saying, that's not true, it equals 120. Uh, so just as a little spoiler alert, if you haven't tried it, five factorial, is 120. See how sneaky that is? So it's all about how you read it and making sure that you understand the context of what you're doing. Okay, so I want to start today just by going over two um, questions from your homework last night that just historically lots of kids have a lot of trouble with. So this first one says Morse code translates letters, digits, and punctuation marks into a sequence of dashes and dots uh, with a maximum mixture of five dots and dashes per character. That is, a character can be represented by a sequence of one, two, three, four, or five dots or dashes. What is the maximum number of Morse code sequences, each representing a character that can be created? Okay, uh, Morse code was, used to be how they would send uh, telegraphs to each other, telegrams to each other. Um, and the only thing I know how to do in Morse code is SOS, which is uh, short, 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 long, 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 short, short, short. So that, that would be um, a dot, dot, dot would be an S, and then a dash, dash, dash would be an O, and then dot, dot, dot would be an S. Okay, so, so what this question is trying to tell or ask us is how many of those characters can we create if we're allowed to have a one character um, item or a two character item or a three character item or a four character item or a five character item. Now, hopefully from your practice last night, you hear me saying or, 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 and when you hear those ors, you know that these are separate cases that we would add together. So what we wanna do is we wanna map out this guy here, let me just get my pencil on again, this guy here represents how many one character items I could have. I could have a dot or I could have a dash. This guy would represent how many two character items. I could have a dot or a dash for the first guy and I could have a dot or a dash for the second guy. And then we just keep going like this for the three character, the four character and the five character. And so when we start cleaning this up, we end up with two, whoops, sorry. We end up with two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32. We add all those separate cases together and then we get um, 62. Sorry, I thought I said plus 62 in the back one, but it was two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32, and that gives us a total of 62. Okay, the other one that often causes stress is this guy. How many different sums of money can be made from three pennies, four nickels, three quarters, and five dollar coins? Now, the way I look at this is I say, okay, let's put Let's just put some things to talk about here. So this will be my uh, pennies and then my nickels and then my quarters and then my dollars. And I'm asking myself, okay, how many options do I have if I want to place pennies there? Now, 
where a lot of kids go wrong is they say, okay, we have three pennies, so we have three options. That's not true. Nobody told me I had to choose a penny. So I actually have four options for the pennies, okay? I could choose no pennies, one penny, two pennies, three pennies. So four options altogether, okay? Likewise, I have five options for uh, my nickels, because I had four nickels, and then I have four options for the quarters, and I have six options for um, my dollars. Now, if I multiply all that together, I get uh, 480, I think, just a sec. Let's look, what did I say? Four times five times four times six is 480. Yeah, I get 480. Uh, 480 is not the right uh, answer, and here's why. I want you to think about slot machines for a second. Don't go tell your parents I'm teaching how to gamble. Um, if you pull a slot machine, what happens is all these little buzzers or all these little wheels go round and round and round until they stop spinning and they give you some sort of a combination, right? So let's say I spun my wheel or spun, that's not spinning a wheel. <laughs> I pulled the crank and all these things spun around and I got the combination one, two, three, four. Well, that means I have one penny, uh, two nickels, three quarters, four uh, dollars. Okay, so that represents one sum of money. And then I did it again. I pulled the crank and went woo 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 and spin, spin, spin around, and I got zero. Oh, that's a bad marker. Uh, zero, three, zero, one. Well, that means I have no pennies, I have uh, three nickels, I have zero quarters, and I have one dollar. So that's a different sum of money. Okay, here's what I want you to notice. There is one time, there's one instance here where when I turn that crank, I would get a really bad combination. Can you think about what that bad combination is? It's zero, 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 zero. That is inside all of these different combinations. I can't have zero, 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 zero because that's not a sum of money. I have to have at least one coin in order to have a sum of money. So what I do is I take my 480, and I subtract the one bad combination that I have, and that would leave me with uh, 479. Okay. All right. Now, this is not in your notes, but it's a little investigation that I kind of want you to humor me with and try it. So in a minute, you're gonna pause me and you're gonna try and draw these out. When some objects that we are arranging are identical, we end up with special cases of permutations. So how many arrangements of three identical blue chairs and two, sorry, three identical green chairs and two identical blue chairs are possible? So I want you to pause me and I want you to draw as many different combinations as you can. Um, if you have two different colors, that would be great or just label them as blue, like B and G or however you wanna do it. But see if you can arrange how many, or see if you can figure out how many arrangements you can make that are different, okay? That are different, that's the key. Okay, so I'm hoping you found more than five, I'm hoping actually, that you got yourself to 10. So here are the 10 that I'm hoping that you will have found. What I did, I, I tried to do this a little bit methodically, I've just hidden my big old head there for, a couple seconds so that you could see the whole picture. Um, but I started over here with two blue and three green and then I just started moving the green chair and bringing the other guys up to meet them and then moving that green chair bringing the other guys up to meet them. Okay and then I looked at uh, I kept going through that process until I got to the very end. Okay so now what do we do with that? It seems to be 10. Okay now had we just done that from permutations, if it had just been five different chairs, I would have gone uh, five factorial, right? I would have gone five factorial or I could have gone five P5. Can you go to your calculator and tell me what five factorial is or five P5 is? And you end up with 120, right? Okay, so somehow, if they were all different, I would have ended up with 120. With this particular color combination, I end up with 10. And the question is, why do I end up with 10? Well, it's a very simple answer, actually. 
think about the word in a minute. We're going to talk about the word Bob, but just think about Bob for a second. Okay. If I switch these B's, I would get this word. There's no difference between that word. Okay. And so because, listen really carefully to this statement, there are two B's in this word. There are two factorial ways to arrange two items, which means there are two factorial arrangements that are useless. So we have to divide those useless arrangements out, okay? So now, in this example, we actually have two sets of repeats. We have two blue chairs and we have three green chairs. So that means there are two factorial arrangements that are useless that have to be divided out for the blue chairs, just swapping each other around. And then there are three factorial arrangements for the three green chairs that would be useless. Again, because we're just swapping green chairs with green chairs and that's not gonna change the picture, okay? So we end up with the five factorial. That's what it would be if it was all different letters, but then we have to divide out the repeats of um, our green chairs and we have to divide out the repeats of our blue chairs. And that actually is what gives us 10. Now, if you have an older model calculator that doesn't open up a fraction button for you first, just as a word of caution, uh, make sure that you've got this bottom thing in its own set of brackets, okay? If you have like a newer Casio or a newer TI, you can open up the fraction first so that you've got like a box, a line, and a box. Then you can just put them uh, in the top box and in the bottom box, that's okay. But if you have an older model, make sure that the bottom has its own set of brackets there. All right, so let's try and practice a few of these and see how we're feeling. So as I said, Here's Bob. How many ways can the three letters in the name Bob be uniquely arranged? Well, if they were all different letters, that'd be three factorial. But then um, I have to divide out my repeats, which in this case would be two Bs, so I'll have to divide by two factorial. So there should be three different ways, and these are the three different ways. B-O-B, O-B-B, and B-B-O. Okay, YOLO. Um, I have four letters, so that'd be four factorial, but I have two O's that are the same, so I divide by two factorial, four factorial divided by two, whoops, sorry, four factorial divided by two factorial is 12, okay? Banana, I have one, two, three, four, five, six letters but I have three A's and two N's. So I end up with six factorial divided by three factorial, two factorial, which is 60, okay? Um, okay, I kept this one in, we took it out of your book. So this is just one to talk about, but try Canadian. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters this time. Again, I have three A's and two N's, so I end up with eight factorial divided by three factorial, two factorial. You should be able to get in your calculator 3,360. Okay. How many different eight letter arrangements of the word February are possible if the word begins with an R? Okay, so again, always kind of map this out. I have two R's to choose from. So I'm just actually gonna draw this out with you for a sec. I have two R's. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters all together. So I have seven letters left that I don't care about. Okay, so I'm gonna times that by all the other letters, which would be seven factorial, because I don't really care about anything else there. Okay, now that's great, except that I also have repeating uh, letters. I have two Rs. So whenever you have repeating letters, you still have to divide out the repeats, okay? So I'm gonna divide this by two factorial to take care of the fact that I had two Rs. So I end up with two times seven factorial all over two factorial and that's 5,040. I do really want to encourage you, make sure you're putting this stuff in your calculator, pause me, try it in your calculator, make sure you're getting the right answer. 
So now we're going to look at the word begins with exactly one R. Now that changes things. I'm still going to just start at the beginning and work my way through. If I want to begin with one R, I have two R's to choose from. But it's the second letter I have to think about now. The second letter is going to be a non-R. Okay, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters. Two of them are R's. That means six of them are non-R's. So there's a six right here. Okay, then I'm going to multiply by everything else. I have six letters left, so that would be six factorial. And again, I have to remember I want to divide my repeats out. So that's where this two times six times six factorial, and then we divide everything by two factorial, um, and that gets rid of our repeats. That should equal 4,320. Okay. How about the vowels must be together? in order a e u so what i do is i'm gonna have a little spot here for a e u okay and we're just going to call we're going to glue those together so that's going to be one spot i have five other spots left because i had eight uh, letters all together so this is one two three four five six seven eight so all together what I need you to see there is I have six spots that I'm arranging because who, who's to say AEU has to go in the front, right? I just stuck it there for the visual, but it's still a spot that gets moved around. So altogether, I have six positions that I'm arranging. And so the answer becomes six factorial. Okay, again, I have to think through the two R's. So I divide it by two factorial to divide out my repeats, and that's gonna give me a total answer of 360. Okay, what if the vowels must be together in any order? So I still have this sort of a combination. I still have six um, factorial that I'm arranging, but now I can, inside this one spot, I can arrange those three letters. It's inside that one spot, so I'm, I'm still forcing them to stay together but inside that one spot, I can do three factorial arrangements, right? Because it could be like AEU or AUE or EAU or EUA, or sorry, yeah, EUA, you know what I'm doing. Anyway, three factorial. So that guy's three factorial. Um, and then I have one, two, three, four, five, six spots that I'm rearranging. So that'll be six factorial. And then I also have to divide out those repeats. So I end up with three factorial times six factorial divided by two factorial. Reminder, the two factorials, because I'm dividing out the fact that there are two R's. So any, that two factorial represents just those two R's switching places, and it doesn't actually create a different, um, a different scenario, okay? So that equals in total 2,160. Okay, <clears throat> so, now we're going to take a look at the vowels must not be together. Um, there are three vowels in this word, the A, the E, and the U. That means there are five letters that aren't vowels. Um, I'm going to label those as C for now, just for consonant. But here are my five consonant letters. And I can arrange these five letters any way I want, right? It doesn't matter the order of those at all. So just that, just those five letters that I don't really care about, that would be five factorial. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think about either side of each one of those kind of placeholders. Um, we would have what I would call a safe spot, okay? So I have one, two, three, four, five, six circles that I put in here on either side of my consonants that I don't care about. These are safe spots that I could put one of the vowels. So like say I put, um, Say I put the A here, the E here, and the U here. Well, they're not touching now, right? They're, they, I'm guaranteed they will never touch because there's always at least one consonant in between them. Or say I put the A here, and the U here, and the E here. They're still not touching each other because there's one consonant in between them, okay? So all of these red circles are safe spots that I can place a vowel, and I'm okay. I have one, two, three, four, five, six safe spots, and I need to use three of them. So I end up with six permute three. 
Now, when I put that all together, then that gives me five factorial. That's the five spots here that I can arrange anywhere I want times six per mu three. Those are my safe spots. I have six of them and I want to use three of them. And then I still have to divide by two factorial because of those two repeating R's. Okay, so five factorial times six P three all divided by two factorial. That's going to give me 700 or 7,200. All right. The yearbook committee is made up of six members. They stand in line facing the camera for the picture. If Steve and Nick must be together, how many arrangements are possible? So I stick Steve and Nick together. So if Steve and Nick become essentially one item, I'm gonna look at this as I have Steve and Nick as one and I have four other people. So all together, that's five, um, five kind of spots that I'm arranging. But then inside that one spot that I'm calling Steve and Nick, it could go Steve and Nick, or it could go Nick and Steve. So there's two factorial ways to arrange that. Okay, so the two factorial is for arranging SN or NS inside one category. And then the five factorial is I've got four friends I don't care about right now. And then that one position of Steve Nick is five positions altogether that I'm arranging. Okay, so that equals 240. What if Steve and Nick must not be together? Then how many ways are there for the picture? Okay, so for this guy, this is just like the uh, vowels not together. What I can do is I can say, okay, one, two, three, four friends that I don't care how they're standing. So that's four factorial, okay? Now, these are all those safe spots for Steve and Nick. I have five safe spots. And I need two of them, one for Steve and one for Nick, so I could multiply that together in my calculator. Okay, when there's only two of them, the other way I could do this is the complement, because the thing that I don't want is Steve and Nick together. Okay, um, and so I know that the total would be there's uh, six people all together, so the total would be six factorial. On the previous slide, I talked about Steve and Nick together, which is the one thing right now I don't want, okay? Um, so that was two factorial, five factorial. So I could go six factorial minus the thing I don't want, which is Steve and Nick together. What's left over is the thing I want. Now, some of you may ask, well, why didn't you do that with the other question, with the AUE? This, this concept of the complement like this only works when it's two things that can't be together. As soon as you put three things that can't be together, the complement kind of falls apart there because it's not thinking about like two of them together and one of them apart uh, and other scenarios like that, okay? Okay, in how many ways can three grade 10s and three grade 11s be arranged in a row if no two people of the same grade can sit together, okay? So does it matter who starts? Can I start with a grade 11 or could I start with a grade 10? In this one, it doesn't matter, right? So I have to actually take that into account. If it doesn't matter, that means I, there are more options to think about, okay? Um, but just for a visual, I'm gonna start with 10. So I said, here's a grade 10, here's a grade 11, here's a grade 10, here's a grade 11, here's a grade 10, here's a grade 11. There are three grade 10s right now that I have to choose from for this spot, and then two grade 10s, and then one grade 10, and then there are three grade 11s, and then two grade 11s, and then one grade 11. So I want to see this, I want you to see this as three factorial, three factorial, times two, because I could have this whole other conversation again, going 11, 10, 11, 10, 11, 10, and so starting with a grade 11 kid, instead of starting with a grade 10 kid, okay? So I end up with three factorial times three factorial times two, or a total of 72. Okay, a committee of seven people will be formed for seven different roles. How many possibilities for six students and four teachers to be on the committee if there are no other restrictions? Well, if there are no other restrictions, I don't care who's a student and who's a teacher right now. I know I have 10 people and I need a committee of seven. Okay, the fact that they have different roles right now, like one's a president, one's a secretary, one's a treasurer, one's a, uh, some other role, I don't know, correspondent, one's a researcher, one's a scientist, I, I don't know. Anyway, 
Um, so it'd be 10 P7, which is 604,800. Okay, so what if Steve must be on the committee? Um, now, everybody's first reaction is, who's Steve? It doesn't matter. The next question will be, well, is Steve a teacher or a student? It actually doesn't matter right now because I haven't broken the question down into what I need for teachers and what I need for students, okay? But this particular question is a little bit more um, in depth than it may look at first glance. <clears throat> so I'm actually gonna show you how to do this three different ways. Part of the great things or one of the great things about permutations and combinations is if you are able to arrive at the same answer in multiple ways, um, you can be much more sure that you have the right answer, okay? So here's the first way I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna look at it from the um, perspective of positions, okay? So Steve needs a position, he needs a role, and then I have six other roles that need to get filled by nine possible people, okay? So for Steve, there are seven roles um, available and he's gonna have one of them. And then there are six other ones available um, that I'll grab from nine different people, okay? So that's one way to look at it, 7P1 times 9P6, um, and that would be 423,360. Another way to look at it is to say, okay, let's do sort of a fundamental counting principle conversation. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's my seven uh, committee people. I know it's a permutation because everybody gets a different role. So let's say Steve goes here, and then I have nine other, or sorry, six other spots that I fill from nine people. So that would be nine P6, okay? So then, but that is specifying that Steve has to be in this particular role. Well, we could also go, Steve could be here and it's another nine P6, or Steve could be here and it's another nine P6, or Steve could be here and it's another nine P6. So what happens is there are seven versions of what I just did here, okay? And so that would look more like this as a visual, seven versions of nine P6, okay? Still the same answer though, 423,360. The last way I wanna show you, um, actually involves a little deeper into the unit than where we are right now, but for some of you, you'll catch on right quick. Um, and for others, you may say, that doesn't make sense. Well, give yourself another couple lessons and it will make sense. But I wanna show it to you at this point, if anything, just to give you a snapshot, okay? So what I can do is I can say, okay, the first thing I need to do is make my seven person committee. Well, I need Steve and six other people. Now, to make a committee, if there's no roles assigned to make a committee, that's a combination, okay? So I have Steve, which would essentially be, there's one Steve and I want him, so that's like one choose one. Um, and then I have nine other people and I want six of them, so that'd be nine choose six. So that gives me a seven person committee. Then I'd have to multiply that by seven factorial because I take that seven person committee and I assign a role to each of them, okay? So then that becomes the seven times six times five times four times three times two times one to the seven people I've already selected. So that becomes one C1 times nine C6 times seven factorial, which again is still 423,360. So I've given you three different visuals doesn't matter which one you use. You look at the one that makes the most sense to you. But the point I wanna make is if you can look at it in different perspectives and each perspective is still giving you the same answer, then you have a really solid handle on what's happening here. Okay, awesome. Okay, what if Steve can't be on the committee? Well, there's one Steve and I don't want to choose him. So I'm gonna represent that as one, uh, permute none, because I don't want him, okay? Then there's nine people left uh, to pick from. 
uh, and I, I don't have anybody in my committee yet, so I still need seven people for the committee. So I'm going to represent that as one pick zero. So that's Steve, and I don't want him. And then there's nine other people, and I need seven of them. Okay. When I multiply that together, I end up with one, one pick one is, or sorry, one pick zero is just one. There's one way to pick nothing, and that's to pick nothing. Um, but then nine pick seven is 181,440. Now, you brilliant kids out there might say, well, what's, what's the point of writing the one P zero anyway? Mathematically, there really isn't. But visually, if you were going to do this on a written response on a diploma, we would want to make sure you're communicating that you understand there's one Steve there and you are purposely not picking him. So that's why I've written it that way. Okay, it's all about the communication. Okay, what if the role of treasurer and secretary must be held by teachers? So remember, just like we talked about yesterday, we always have to deal with the specific restrictions first. So I have four teachers and I need two of them to fulfill a role right now. Okay, so I'm going to take my four teachers and I'm going to pick two of them, one for treasurer and one for secretary. The rest doesn't matter. So um, I now have still eight people in my selection pool because I started with 10 and I just used two people. Um, and I need to finish my committee. So if I have eight people left and I've already assigned two roles, I need five other people. And so that's where the HP5 is coming from. Okay. So then when I multiply that together, I get 80,640. Okay, how about the role of treasurer and secretary must be held by teachers, so that's just like the one I did, and the roles of president and vice president must be held by students. So again, I have to deal with those restrictions first. So the teachers, um, I have four and I want to pick two of them for treasurer and secretary. Then students, um, I have six of them and I want to pick two of them, one for president and one for uh, vice president. So now, um, I have how many people do I have left? I have six people left altogether because I've just put four in place in the committee. Uh, so I have six people left, and I need three of them to finish off my committee of seven. So that's my teachers, and I took two of them to fulfill their roles. There's my kids, and I took two of them to fulfill those ro roles. Um, then I have six people left and I needed three. Take a look at how many I'm selecting, two plus two plus three, that's my seven person committee. Um, and that would be 43,200. Okay, another application uh, that we deal with is pathways. Okay, now with pathways, a pathway can only involve um, two directions and must go along the grid lines. So determine the number of pathways that could be used to get from point A to point B. You always have to go closer to your destination. So you're never allowed to backtrack. You're never allowed to turn around, okay? So let's take a look at this pathway for a sec. I need to go from A to B. So what I'm saying is, hey, I could go like this. That is one viable pathway, okay? Or I could say, well, why can't I do this? Here's a pathway. I could go that way. Or what if I said, no, no, I want to choose my pathway to be like this. Okay, and so the purpose is, what this question is asking us is how many different ways can I go from point A to point B? Okay, now, this is actually super easy once you catch the visual. No matter what you're doing, no matter which direction you're heading, I need you to see that somehow you're going to have to go up, 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 and you're going to have to go right right, right. Okay, no matter which pathway you choose, you have to go up three times and you have to go right three times. And so if you think of it that way, up, 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 right, 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 that's you, 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 R, R, R. Think of that like a word and we're just trying to arrange that. Okay, so there's six letters there, but I have three U's and I have three R's. So I'd have to divide by three factorial to take care of my repeating U's. And I'd have to divide by three factorial to take care of my repeating R's. So that ends up being six factorial divided by three factorial times three factorial 
plug that in your handy dandy you trusty dusty calculator. I really hope your calculator is not dusty because that would mean you're not using it. Uh, your answer is 20. Okay. All right. Next guy. So what I need you to see here is this is just like three little questions in one. In order to get from point A to point B, I have to go from there to there. So figure out that. Then I have to go from there to there. So figure out that. And then I have to go from there to there. So figure out that. Okay. If I'm just going from there to there, that would be right, right, down, down. So it's like four factorial divided by two factorial, two factorial for my repeats. If I just want to go from here to here, that would be right, right, down, down, down. So that would be five factorial divided by two factorial, three factorial for my repeats. And then this guy would be three factorial divided by two factorial. Okay, now I have to get from here to here and I have to get from here to here and I have to get from there to there. So when you're finding yourself saying and, you multiply those separate cases together because they all have to happen at, at once. So I've got six times 10 times three, which is a total of 180. Then we could go 3D. Now, apart from um, this making you a little dizzy, um, you do it the same way, okay? So no, if I have to go from A to B, I have to go right, right, down, down, back, okay? Or however you wanna call it. So in total, that's five moves, and there's two sets of two repeating there. So that'd be five factorial divided by two factorial, two factorial, which is 30. Okay. All right. So that's where I leave you. Uh, give this a try for homework. And uh, again, I know I said this with the last lesson, but the more practice you can do with this, the better you're going to feel about it, okay? Because it's a whole other way of thinking. Um, have fun with it and come see me with any questions that you have. Take care, guys.